1866 on Bromley Kent. His mother was a maid and his father a shopkeeper. No literary influence there. In fact, his career owed a lot to a childhood accident. He broke his leg. He, at age years old, with a broken leg, sitting on the couch for about four and a half months, read every single day of his life, all that time. And it was that reading, and the breadth of the reading, and the scientific nature of some of it, that I think drove him in the way he was going. He began writing little stories when he was about eight or nine years old. And in fact, one or two of them still exist. They are uh, strip cartoons with a text. The one called The Desert Daisy has been reproduced since his death by the University of Illinois. In school, young Herbert George was recognized as extremely bright, and he won a scholarship to the Normal School of Science in London. He taught biology, briefly. But writing was his passion. From the time he started writing, he continued to write in one form or another throughout. Much of the stuff is not uh, published or publishable, but he's working on a time machine by the time he's 18 uh, and writing fairly seriously uh, in a, in a, in about science and education right from the beginning. Wells produced an enormous volume of work in his lifetime. 156 books of fiction, philosophical essays, and political tracts and countless articles. He wrote more words than Shakespeare and Dickens combined. But the quality of his output was uneven. But even in his less successful works, Wells showed a unique power of vision. He could see the likely results of scientific findings and new technologies decades into the future. In 1902, he saw the coming of the suburbs and long-distance commuting. And he predicted new kinds of warfare. Ironclad road fighting machines may perhaps play a considerable part. Aeroplanes will sweep down upon the adversary's rear and will drop explosives and incendiary matters upon them. At the turn of the century, the War of the Worlds captivated a reading public already fascinated by the promise and dangers of science, and by the implications of one scientific theory in particular, evolution. Well shared and exploited the unease Darwin's theory had created, his Martians, in fact, were evolution's product. We men are just in the beginning of the evolution that the Martians have worked out. They have become practically mere brains, wearing bodies according to their needs, just as men wear suits of clothes and take a bicycle in a hurry or an umbrella in the wet. Wells doesn't take sides between the Londoners and the Martians, because part of his marvelous argument is that in time we might evolve to be like the Martians. The Martians, he says, owing to the conditions that they endure on Mars, have evolved from creatures much like us. And after the description of how horrible the Martians are, this is what you get to learn, that it could be us. Or it could be the end of us. Wells is very heavily influenced by Darwin. Wells believed that human beings, Homo sapiens, in the 1890s were at the apex of their rule of the world and very probably would be thrown down by some other species to come. Evolution was a theory widely misused then and later. It seemed to justify everything from colonialism to ideas of supermen and master races. Natural selection became survival of the fittest which in turn became survival of the strongest, most cruel, and ruthless. There was a dark side to evolutionary theory which also cast its shadow on H.G. Wells. Wells wrote a lot that was wrong and that was bad. He did a lot that was wrong and that was bad. He said a lot that was wrong and was bad, and it hasn't been recorded in previous biographies. Michael Corrin's book is a critical biography in the harshest sense of that word. One might even call it attack biography. 
Corrine is not fond of his subject. I was trying to put the record straight. As a writer, he was a social engineer, so he put forward views and ideas that didn't make the Holocaust possible, didn't make the Khmer Rouge or Mao or Stalin possible, but it gave a sort of intellectual veneer to those ideas. In 1902, Wells published a book of predictions entitled Anticipations. That book showed his gift as a prophet. It also embodied those contradictions in his character that prompt debate to this day. Writing in the final chapter of Anticipations, he predicts a new elite of engineers and scientists who will administer a new utopia, encourage the procreation of what is fine and efficient and beautiful in humanity, and weed out undesirable types. And the method that nature has followed hitherto in the shaping of the world, whereby weakness was prevented from propagating weakness, the method that must in some cases still be called in to the help of man, is death, the merciful obliteration of weak and silly and pointless things. That's what Wills' critics mean when they call him a social engineer. The cool, even cold detachment with which he mused about obliterating weak and silly and pointless things can be read dismayingly as a precursor to the insane experiments in social engineering that would scar the 20th century. Wells has also been accused of racism and anti-Semitism partly on the basis of the new society he described in Anticipations. And as Wells said, for example, as for the dark and swarthy and yellow people, I take it they will have to go. Or the Jews are termites in the civilized world, I take it they will have to go. That's not entirely fair. This is what Wells actually wrote. And how will the new republic treat the inferior races? How will it deal with the black, the yellow man? How will it tackle that alleged termite in the civilized woodwork? the Jew. Certainly not as races at all. Whatever men come into its efficient citizenship, it will let come. While the logic of those sentences are anti-racist, there is, however, a racist tone to his language. And for the rest, those swarms of black and brown and dirty white and yellow people who do not come into the new needs of efficiency, I take it they will have to go. And yet in the same book, Wells also argued forcefully against the racist idea, and he denounced the twisting of Darwinian theory. The worldwide repudiation of slavery in the 19th century was done against a vast sullen force of ignorant pride, which, reinvigorated by the new delusions, swings back again to power. As a rising young literary star, Wells was invited to join the Fabian Society, a socialist group which included playwright George Bernard Shaw and other intellectuals of the day. But Wells was a socialist full of contradictions. He didn't have much use for the masses. He hated trade unions. He was a child of the lower middle classes who was terrified of the lower classes. He strongly supported the Bolshevik Revolution. But unlike so many others on the left, he was revolted by Stalin's repressions. Yes, he went and saw Stalin. He was much more critical of the Stalin regime than almost any of the other leading uh, critics from the left in this country, certainly much more than Bernard Shaw and Sidney Webb, who went there and wrote uh, highly favorable views about Stalin. Michael Foote, the former leader of Britain's Labour Party, knew Wells personally and is pained by suggestions that he supported social engineering, Soviet style. Indeed, when he went to see Lenin, Lenin denounced him ferociously as a ridiculous little bourgeois or something of that sort. But, of course, what uh, Wells wrote about Russia in the shadows at that time, considering at the moment when it was written, it was a, I don't say, a fully prophetic book, and some things that he said were right and some things that were wrong, but what he said were the genuine judgments of a liberal mind. A satirical aside in the philosophical fantasy a modern utopia, foresaw in 1905 a genocide practiced by the Nazis. Furthermore, this man accused of racism and social engineering also was a lifelong libertarian and the principal author of an idea called the Universal Rights of Man that later was enshrined as the